We cannot successfully navigate this life without learning to be better askers because there is no mechanism available to us that has the ability to reveal what is hidden like asking. When you start asking the right questions, you're going to start meeting the right people, wake up the imagination, the illumination, the insight, and a solution that no other thing can do it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The 2%, where, as always, we're interviewing incredible people in all walks of life. Why? To help decode excellence, help give you the tips, tools, and strategies that you can use to close that gap between your current and best self. And I'm super thrilled to have on the show two amazing people, Crystal and Mark Victor Hansen. Welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you, Eric. So happy to be here with you. We're honored to be in the show, and we love the idea of getting everybody into that 2%, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if they ask the right questions. Yeah, and well, I'm, I'm so glad that you kind of zoomed in on that, because um, you know, I, I, when I first came across Abraham Maslow's assertion, you know, his estimate that only 2% of people uh, realize their, their full potential in life, I, I remember I thought it was terrifying and liberating. At the same time, terrified. <laughs> <laughs> right? you know, ter- ter- terrified. It's like, oh my gosh, uh, is this not the world's biggest problem then? That we need yeah. to kind of get people right to break free from the ninety-eight percent, and then liberating because oh, there's this this better thing out there that we can kind of migrate towards or into. And and I know you both are kind of big proponents of this uh, thinking. You're both accomplished entrepreneurs, speakers authors, uh, Crystal, you're the founder of, you know, Crystal Vision Life. Uh, and I know that's very much about discovering the best version of you. So we speak a common language there, big time. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and Mark, um, uh, you know, I mean, you have you know, many highlights as well. Um, people probably most know you for that Chicken Soup for the Soul um, series. I think 500 million um, yes, copies. Sir. Copies sold. That's the most books ever sold in one series so far until we top it with our new book, Ask, The Bridge from Your Dreams, <laughs> Your Destiny, which based on right now, like we were talking before the show, our destiny is to outperform what I've already done in Chicken Soup because it's state of mind that creates state of result based on the questions that you ask. And this, uh, I mean, you have a huge bestseller list to add it to, right? So I think there's uh, over, is, is it nearly 60 number one New York Times bestsellers? Yeah, 59, number one, but I've written 318 books. And, and the trouble is the reason some of them are number one in Vietnam and that that never make it to number one here. So it doesn't matter to me because what I want to do is get everyone to read because I can't. I think you can't be freed until you know how to really read and, and, and use the self-propelling stuff that Dr. A. Maslow said. How do we get to self-realization so you can go beyond that to the next two hierarchies are beauty and truth, which is one of the things we're going to talk about philosophically today, you said. Yeah, wonderful. So um, I I used to say to my team, um, ask not, want not, which we've all heard, but I would say ask not, want not, ask more, get more. And um, and it seems very much in line with uh, with the book, ask, uh, tell us a bit about this book. What's what's the central premise? What's it all about? Well, we've been blessed to talk in 80 countries to some 7 million people. We meet wonderful people, great people, good attitude and everything. But the difference between somebody who succeeds, Eric, a little and somebody who's vastly successful or in your language uses our full potential in all the dimensionality of their life, which is what we want, is they either don't ask or they do ask. And if they do ask, they got to ask themselves, ask God, others, and ask God. The three channels we're saying is most people haven't asked themselves, what is my full potential? So we're saying, hey, look, people, the way I define it is they're living half lives rather than full lives because everyone said, well, you can't, you're not going to be a, a published with our house. And we got turned down by 144 publishers. No, they all made a terrible mistake because I <laughs> sold $2 billion worth of books, a billion dollars worth of licensing. So the point is, when you start asking the right questions, you're going to start meeting the right people, wake up the imagination, the illumination, the insight, and a solution that no other thing can do. And that's why Abe Maslow was able to create his hierarchy of needs. Because most people get sucked into well, all I want to do is survive. All I want to do is pay my bills and have a job. Well, a job means you're just over broke. Not a good idea. 
<laughs> so, 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 so the premise is, is that if you ask more questions and the right questions, you can get the, the things that you're seeking in the domains that matter most to you in life. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's, I think so, but it's even more than that, Eric. I think like we cannot successfully navigate this life without learning to be better askers because there is no mechanism available to us that has the ability to reveal what is hidden like asking. It's really the only thing that is able to do that. So, and it's a tool we can all use. That's the amazing thing. When, when we were born into this lifetime, we came into this world as these beautiful little uncorrupted askers, you know, these little children who, first of all, we were wildly curious. We asked mm -hmm. about everything, who, what, when, where, why. That's the way we evolved that's the way we grew and then we also were not afraid to ask for what we wanted you know and ask for more 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 of what we wanted pretty much ask for anything but then depending on how you know we were parented what happened in our school years you know sit down don't ask questions till you're called on stop asking me so many questions i'm tired of you know the questions whatever um you know that that beautiful natural ability to ask those questions and to be curious starts to get crushed out of you and then you go on to jobs and work and you're trying to ask questions and your opinions not you know valued and suddenly we find ourselves as adults standing there pretty much uh terrified to ask anyone, anything, and a little bit ashamed almost that we don't have all the answers. And that is a sad state because we'll never have all the answers in this life. And until we can open up to that beautiful ability to ask again, to be wildly curious about life, to wonder about everything, to inquire about everything, and to ask for what we want, until we get to that point, we can't really fulfill our greatest destiny. Yeah, well, and realizing your fullest potential, right? Becoming all that you're capable of being. Exactly. And I love that you use the word curiosity. And I know that you know, features um, uh, a lot in the book. And thanks, by the way, for the, the copy that you shared with me. I appreciate that. And, um, mm -hmm. um, and that's a special word for me, too, especially when it comes to asking questions. Um, when I'm working with entrepreneurs and leaders, uh, one of the things that I'll often hear from them is, my partner says that I'm not present enough. And, <laughs> and, and, and then they think, how do I become more present? You know, how do I improve my presence? I hear this all the time, but I don't know what to do. And what I always tell them is that I say, you know what, just forget that word, forget the word present. And yeah. instead, when you're with your partner, just be curious because you cannot be curious and not present at the same time. Right. And if you just focus on curiosity, the presence happens by default. And it's simple things, isn't it? Like your wife or your husband, for example, uh, shares that they're excited about something, but not letting it stop there and saying, oh, well, well, why is that? What is it about that that gets you going so much? Right. Um, can you relate to what I mean about like these, these curiosity based questions? Uh, oh, that is a, I, I love that you, you switch it and just change it to curiosity because I think, yeah, present, be present. That's so hard to define, but curiosity is very easy to understand. And when we, we looked at a lot of studies when we, when we did this book, Eric, and the studies prove out that, that people in situations like business situations or personal relationship ships. Those people who ask the most questions, who are the most curious, are perceived to be better business partners, more likable business partners. Like, I like you. Now I, I want to do business with you. Or um, in the dating study, you were more likely to get a second date if you asked more questions, if you were more curious. Because, you know, it's funny when people are in business or relationships, for business, for example, you know, we often want to go in and tell what we have and tell all about ourselves and tell how great we are and our product and service is the greatest thing in the world. And same thing in relationships. We want to talk about ourselves, how great we are, all these great things we've done, right? But, you know, in a, in a business scenario, people don't want to do business with you until you know them, right? So mm. what asking does is creates a bond. So instead of me coming in and, and we talk about, we have very specific stories in the book and instead of me sitting down with you and saying, you know, here's what I have, here's what I want. What if I just sat down and said, Eric, you know, tell me what's happening this year. You know, how's your performance? What are your, what are your five biggest pain points this year? 
you know, and what, what would it look like if we could even solve three of them, you know, mm. how would it feel? So all of a sudden I am curious about you. I want to know about you. And all, and when I start asking about you, you start opening up and trusting me more and we start to create a bond, right. That we didn't have before. If I were just to come in and tell you how great I am and I'm just going to, I've got your perfect solution for everything. And so that curiosity the asking creates this amazing bond between two human beings and yeah. you will be more likable in business. You'll be more likable in relationships. Your partner, your business partner, your, your love partner will feel more understood and more connected to you. And it, and it works fabulously at networking events as well, right? So you can go to a, a networking event and you can uh, meet someone and ask the typical question. Oh, so what do you do? And the curiosity, though, can help you get that one level deeper. You know, they respond with whatever they do. And then you can say, oh, so out of all the things that you could have chose, why did you choose that career? And then you get to another whole level, right? Or, you know, where, uh, where have you lived? And they list, list out one or two countries. Okay, out of all the places that you could have chose to live, what was it about those countries or cultures that attracted you the most? And so I totally, I totally buy into it. I totally get it. I totally love it. Um, I'm... I'm obsessed with um, three domains uh, because I feel that in our quest to close the gap between our current and best self, um, that we're seeking to become our best on the health, wealth, and the relationship front. So health, wealth, and relationships. And I love how in the Ask book, um, you very much have structured it in a similar fashion around health, wealth, and relationships. And so can we go into each of those areas and maybe give people a flavor for, you know, what are some of the questions that you should be asking on the health front, on the wealth front, on the relationship front? Yeah, we're saying you've got to ask yourself, ask others and ask God. And it's got dimensionality to all of it and all of them interlace and interface with each other. But let me just do wealth first, because I'm thinking about Elon Musk, because what did he do? He gets shut down by the governor of California, says, you will not make any cars. You're laying off 90,000 people. And he goes, no, that's his decision, but I'm gonna ask a different question. What's needed right now that my company can make? And he calls up the head of 3M and said, you guys can't make the respirators that theoretically are needed. I've got all the materials. I got all the engineering. I got all the software. I got all the 3D printing. I can do anything. I'll just split 50-50 with you. But when he did that, 90,000 people, first of all, Eric, kept their jobs. Second of all, he yeah. made the respirator. But he also just accidentally made 90,000 cars and became the richest man in the world. But he also kept thinking and asking questions, which is what our job is in wealth creation. He said, what else could this car do? And he's got two, uh, no, sorry, 20 billion miles of AI. So he's got the most AI of any car ever. And then he said, well, could we make it a, a, an auto driving car? And he's got that wired and, and capable. Then he said, could we figure out how to fly? And then if the battery was five years from now, what would the battery be? Well, it would be a flat battery. And he says, good, I'll go buy for a $100 million company called Maxwell that makes graphene batteries. What we're saying is the question is the answer. Einstein, who is my teacher in graduate school, is Buckminster Fuller, but his teacher was Albert Einstein. And Albert said, if I had a great problem, I'd spend 95 minutes on asking what are all the dimensions of the question and five minutes on solving it. And most people spend 95 <laughs> minutes going the wrong way. And that's why they don't get up to the top 2%. That's why it's important to read our book, Ask the Bridge from Your Dreams or Destiny. It's important to listen to podcasts like yours that get you to wake up all that beautiful dimensionality of your mind. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and, and on, the, on the health front, um, Crystal, what, what, what are some of the, the key questions that people need to be asking themselves? Right. And you honestly can't solve your health and fitness problems until you're willing to take that asking journey inside of yourself. And it's really starts with the ask yourself part. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of people that I coach for, for health and, and fitness, they, they had been on that, you know, roller coaster for so many years, they gain weight, they lose it, they save their fat clothes. So, you know, <laughs> just in case. So it starts with, just you know, you, <laughs> I know, right there, there, there was, there was a guy who had like a skinny wardrobe, a medium wardrobe, and a half <laughs> wardrobe, and he kept them all. And so it's like, the first question is, do I really believe that I can be this fit slim person? Or am I holding on to my old identity? 
Because so often when we're in a state that we don't like, or we say we don't like it, okay, and we really don't like it, it's miserable, but we've kind of become addicted or conditioned to that identity. So, you know, am I really willing to let go of this identity? To, mm. Am I willing to see myself as someone new? Am I willing to release that identity? And, and even some of the emotional entanglements that go along with that identity that we've hold on, held on to, right? And, and dive a little deeper. What, are, what, what sort of, um, am, I, am I getting some kind of protection from these layers of, of fat? Is it, am I trying to protect myself in some way? What if I let go of this tomorrow? What if I saw myself as a fit, slim person tomorrow? Am I ready to be comfortable with that? You know, so, and there are so many questions in the book that we also talk about. Do I love myself enough? You know, I always say um, with my Skinny Life program, I want you to love food more than you, you ever have, but love the food that loves you back. So mm. the question there is, do you care enough about yourself and love yourself enough to be curious about what foods are going to love you back because there's so much information out there. It's almost like th there's no excuse to be overweight, right? That all the information on how to be fit, slim and healthy is there, you know? And, and, and then really questioning like, does this food love me back? What does it do when I put this 300 calorie donut in my body or this 300 calorie chicken breast? What is the difference? When I, you know, when I start, once I swallow that food, where does it go? And, and how does my body deal with that? So when I swallow the donut, what really happens when I ask that question, I really look for the answer. I'm going to overtax my pancreas. My pancreas is going to start overworking, trying to deal with all that sugar burden that I just gave it. In the meantime, did I give myself any real nutrition? No. <laughs> the answer to yeah. that question, it's, it's a quick energy buzz, but it's a high and a low, you know, so all of everything, everything in life can be resolved and solved. If you're willing to ask those, you know, gut honest question, take that inner journey, the reflective journey, which is the ask yourself part. And that's where it all starts. And Eric, I, can I add something to that? Yeah, yeah, go for it. I want to be real quick, but we were just out at dinner on a Friday night, two weeks ago with people who go on name, but they got all the money in the world. And the husband just had a heart attack and he said, body's falling apart. And he's a good looking guy and, and a dear friend and a top um, pickleball player in the world. But the, the danger here is that he wakes up and eats white bread and then goes to the hospital and the doctor never tells him about nutrition. So back to your question about question, what would it do? What would it take me to be into peak comprehensive health? And, I, and each of us have to study that. You can't depend on your own spouse all the time because they may not have studied health. And, and you yeah. can't depend on your medical doctor or practitioner, you know, to have it. So you've got to do your own homework. And we spend a lot of time on our health. And I'm going to live be 127 options for renewal because I'm 73, but I'm in, in the high quality of health. And I want a high quantity of health. If you've got crappy health, why do you want to live long? Yeah, no, totally agree. Totally agree. And the, um, when, you were, when you were talking about uh, poor food choices, you know, Crystal, <laughs> I, I couldn't help but laugh to myself because I thought, yeah, but if I'm standing in front of a box of Krispy Kreme donuts, I kind, of, <laughs> I kind of don't even want to be in that situation because I know I'm not going to be asking the right questions or I'll give myself the wrong answers. You know? so, right. so, so, so sometimes the solution is just to not put yourself, you know, in situations where um, even your identity at your best is going to falter, right? Um, yeah, exactly. And you know that, you know, like, am I, am I going to be able to resist this? If not, no, you know, when I'm around it, I tend to eat it. So should I even have it around? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, okay, relationship front now. I know that's a big area for, um, for you both. And I know um, uh, features in the book as well. Um, so on the relationship front, you know, we're social beings. Um, it's, uh, it's the whole fabric of our existence, right, to, to interact with others. And um, what what should we be doing there? Can you give us a flavor of the right questions that we should be asking right. ourselves there? So when you know when we have problems in relationships or we're not we're triggering each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, so much of that is coming from our own subconscious programming. You know the things we've experienced in life, the beliefs we've taken on, and sort of the conditions around those beliefs. So our partner, our spouse, does something. 
and it triggers us. And so all of a sudden we're in this situation, either we're not connecting or we're flat out angry and like fighting, right? So that's the best time to just sit down and ask the questions, okay? And like like very simple questions, like go by your t- with yourself, sit down. And some of these questions are in the book, like what thoughts am I thinking right now about this situation? Well, he doesn't care about me. You know, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking he doesn't care about me. You know, what are the belief? Because he stayed two hours longer at his golf game and he said he was going to be home. His friends are more important than me, that type of thing. Right. So what are the beliefs behind those, behind those thoughts and where did they begin? You know, really asking yourself. And then is that true? Is that belief true? Do you really think he doesn't care about you or was he just maybe enjoying himself and got lost in the moment, you know, and just having a good time. Does it, is it really about his lack of love for you or is it, you know, and that's why we also have to tap into the emotions. What emotions are these beliefs triggering? Okay. And so when you get deep, get deeper into the emotion, well, sometimes people go, I feel abandoned. You know, and you go, that is like, that's such a leap. But when you start going question by question, it seems so illogical. So, but that's why the response is always this distorted thing. We have these distorted responses to something that happens, like someone stays in golf for, two, you know, longer than they said they were going to. Yeah. And somewhere inside of us, that's saying, I'm not lovable. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So question by question answer and so you see the distortion that we all do but like i would say almost every problem in a relationship is a distortion of a thought that created a belief that created triggered emotion and then where did that all start like when did you first start feeling that like as a kid or did something happen you know what so when you start asking yourself then you can go you know what there is there some baggage is this just coming up because of my old baggage or is it is it really a problem and um you know so and there are some things that are real problems you know if you walk in and you know you find whatever your wife with some other man that's a problem (laughs) (laughs) but if she stays too long and you know shopped for an extra hour and got lost in it it doesn't mean she doesn't love you you know what i yeah. mean yeah. so all of, so much of our relationship <laughs> issues <laughs> can be avoided <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah i was yeah I, I, yeah i was just just picturing that situation that would be a definitely a shocking situation <laughs> so but uh, i really want to um build on this um because I, I i love this particular area of um so when we talk about relationships, um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of what goes wrong too in relationships uh, is because there's a, a, an unchecked chain reaction, right? Yes. That is just gets out of control. Yep. And you, you suddenly end up in a situation where you're arguing, for example, with a loved one and you can't even remember how it started. And <laughs> um, right. And, and, um, exactly. and, and, and you use the word trigger. And you know this, I I, lo- I love that word as well, especially as it relates to relationships. Because one of the things that I always uh, say to myself is, and to others, is that um, there are two sides to relationship improvement. It's a two-sided coin. There's a proactive side and the reactive side. And most people think proactively about relationship improvement and that they're seeking right to um, what is it that I can do for the other person. I tend to think that they also then go wrong because they're thinking from their own point of view and not actually asking the other person in your eyes, what should I be doing? Right. Right. But then there's the reactive side to relationship improvement. And I believe that half of the improvement that we can seek in in any relationship can be improved simply by reacting better to that person. And when you say trigger, so one of the exercises that I always ask, uh, you know, the people I work with to do is to list out their loved ones. And, and create a trigger list. What are the things that each person, when they do, is that pet peeve of you that can kind of bring out a suboptimal reaction? Yes. And then I say, and those are the weights in the relationship, Jim, right? Because we're going to look forward to those moments. And then I kind of draw on Stephen Covey. And I think he got this from Rollo May, psychologist in the you know, 1960s. But Rollo May first talked about this concept of the pause, you know, between stimulus and response. And, and then Stephen Covey kind of built on that and said it's within that space lies both our growth and freedom. So I, I, I always look forward to for those triggers because 
that's the moment to insert that pause. And when you pause before you respond, between yes. that stimulus, right? The thing that's triggering you before you respond, when you just pause and then you ask yourself the best version of you, how would the best version of me respond right now? And what I personally find is that if you simply pause, you'll always find the answer. It's like a timeless wisdom in you that will just emerge and say, if you just ask the question, because you'll always know, right, what a suboptimal versus, you know, the best version response is. We don't exactly. need to go to school for that. <laughs> no, right? no, exactly. And I love that. I love the pause. And, and then I love the questions you're asking. Because first of all, identifying through, through questioning, like, what are our triggers? What are those tr triggers? Okay, now you've re laid out the map, like, this is where we're going. So this is what we need to be aware of. And that's what asking the right questions does for you. And then when you get triggered by one of those things, asking the other questions, you know, like, is this my best response? It's amazing how a question will just revector you. If you ask a sincere question of yourself, or it'll, it'll revector your, you to the truth. It'll reveal yeah. what you need to know so that you can show up in life as the best version of yourself. Wonderful. Wonderful. If I may add. Yeah. Yeah. And we are friends with Steve Covey and, and we were competing with him book wise. And I love Dr. Rollo May too. So the point is when you do that pause that Rollo missed, as far as I'm concerned, because he's just a good psychiatrist, is it if you go into what would my God self say? Because then we're at the level of the dimensionality of truth. And and at a God level, you know, you're non-judgmental, you don't find fault, you you you're you're past triggering and being reactive, you're proactive, just saying, I heard what you said. I listen closely, but if we go to a higher dimension and look down on it, this is how we solve it. And that's mm. why that's what the two percent does. And that's why, you know, the very top of, of Maslow's hierarchy is truth, which which transcends self-realization, self-actualization, guruship, all that stuff. Mm. Right. So 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 Mark, what what gets what do you what are the blocks? What gets in the way of people asking the right questions, of, of people having this ability to kind of find their way? Okay, two levels I want to answer. First of all, in our book, we talk about the seven roadblocks to asking, but that's not what you're asking, I don't think. I think what you're saying is, do the people have the right model? And based on, I love all uh, that you're doing, because you've done well, but you're also consulting, I think it said 50 companies as CEOs. Those guys don't, I, by the way, I gotta be, I'm one of us, right? But I, I can see because I've been on the boards of the world's biggest airline and all that, that I get goosebumps telling you this. So I know it's truth for me, whether it's truth for everyone listening is a different question. Do they have enough models in their head? And they're really smart, but are they wise? The question is the difference between reactive and proactive in my mind, and I've never thought this through before, is at, at proactive, you're wise because you're going into your higher God self. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. And reactive, um, I, I see that pathway as well as a way to enter that same domain, right? By pausing and then going into that higher higher being and getting the direction on where you should go next or what you should say next from that source. Reactive is what you said earlier, six paragraphs ago about chain reaction. And usually the chain reaction is an explosion and the boss gets angry you know, just because he goes to his lower self rather than his higher self. And what this shows about is, and, and I own two companies with Bob Proctor called the 3% Club. And we're saying you want to get into only 3% of us in any profession, legal, business, doctoring, dentistry, garbage collectors, janitors, teachers, I don't care what it is, really are profound and decided that this is their right livelihood. And that comes back to what Crystal has been articulating here. Are you asking the questions of depth? Am I going towards what the subtitle of our book is, towards your destiny? Because we believe you're coded at RNA and DNA level to a great destiny. And your job in this thing called the University of Life is discovered by asking what your destiny is and then using your highest imagination to go fulfill it. And can you share, uh, can you, get, can you know, get, get, get us excited about you know, the potential of discovering that destiny? Maybe one of your favorite stories about somebody asking the right questions and then finding their path, finding their calling. 
Yeah, you know, I'd love to share this story about this woman named uh, Lynn Marquis. She came out of college wanting to go into the nonprofit space, and she um, she just her heart was really pulled toward that. So she, one of the first things she did was to put together this um, summer camp for disadvantaged children, and it was you know a, lasted most of the summer, so it was quite expensive. So obviously she had to get funding for it, but it was really going to be a, an amazing you know extensive camp. So she finally got an appointment with the uh, the woman who was like the wealthiest woman in her city who controlled a large family trust. And the day she showed up um, at the woman's office, she was like, I was so scared to ask, <laughs> so intimidated. And this is how most of us are. We're so scared to ask anybody for anything because we're shut down. But she wanted this so badly. She's like, but I couldn't, I couldn't hide the fact that I was shaking. I was so scared. She goes, I was literally visibly like quaking. So she just, she said, I'm so sorry. I'm just so honored to meet with you. And of course the woman was so kind. She's like, no, come in, tell me what you have. They sat down together. She explained this incredible camp how much it would benefit the children. And um, the woman said, well, it sounds wonderful. You know, tell me how much you're, how much you asking for Again, she like got terrified. And she goes, <laughs> she said, I was literally stuttering. She goes, um, I'm asking for $5,000 because that's how much it is to put each camper through. And the woman looked at her and she goes, okay, but how many kids do you want to put through the camp this summer? And she said something like, oh, 285. And the woman said, okay, I'd like to sponsor all of them. Wow. And she, it was just that <laughs> jaw dropping moment where she, she had no idea. I mean, she was so terrified to ask, but she just did it anyway, you know? And the woman so over fulfilled, over granted her wishes so far beyond anything she could have imagined. And so I think the point is, Eric, that we have to learn to find a way. We're going to be terrified sometimes. You know, we have these roadblocks that we talk about in both the unworthiness, the doubt, the fear, the pattern paralysis, these things that shut us down from asking and especially asking others, even asking ourselves, we're afraid to ask, but asking others seems to be particularly terrifying. But when we're able to just sort of, you know, we're going to feel afraid sometimes, but stepping on that fear with some courage and doing it anyway, um, you never know what it's going to do, that it could it could elevate you, you know, exponentially to the next level. And when we don't ask and we hold back, we might have just given up something so big that we didn't, um, you know, if we're not willing to give birth to that opportunity by asking, then we're cutting ourselves off from our greatest opportunities and our greatest potentials. What, um, uh, I'm starting to think about the Pareto, Pareto principle now, and um, that all questions, of course, aren't created equal, and so that there's leverage and you're, you know, questioned. Um, and I'd love if, if you could each share, what is the most powerful question that you asked yourself personally and what impact did that have on your life? Even if it was just something that created a the start of a pivot that manifested into, you know, a, you know, a beautiful new path, but yeah, what was the moment and what was the question? I'll go first. Um, I've been with, in graduate school with Bucky Fuller. I tried to be fuller rather than myself. I built Wall Street Racquet Club, <laughs> Botanical Gardens, Aviaries. I was building out of PVC plastic at the wrong time. The oil embargo went up. I went down. And I said to myself, oh, my God, what if I go bankrupt? Ask the wrong question. I just wrote down what you said. All questions are not created equal. That's from Animal Farm at an iteration I never even thought of. I love it. Now we'll quote you on it. Anyhow, um, I said, what if I go bankrupt? Check the book out of the library. How to go bankrupt by yourself? <laughs> Talk about the best worst experience. For six months, I was sleeping in front of another guy's sleeping bag. And in I keep saying, bedroom. In, bedroom, in, a outside, in a sleeping bag outside <laughs> another guy's bedroom because I'm broke. And, and uh, I kept saying, okay, God, what you, what's my destiny? And God doesn't play that game. He said, you got to get definite with the infinite. God says, okay, Mark, what do you want to do? go, whoa, there's a heavy question, by the way, for everybody listening. And I said, I want to talk to people that care about things that matter, that would make a life transformative difference. I, that was miracle number one. Miracle number two, I go to my three roommates in Hicksville and I say, hey, guys, you know anyone young speaking that's not a Broadway star, a celebrity, a doctor, a lawyer, a famous person? They said, yeah, there's this kid out in 
hop hog talking and, and here's a ticket. Here's my ticket. You take my ticket. I can't go to his real estate meeting. Well, for three hours, this, that was the second miracle. That guy gave me his ticket, which, I mean, that just is a miracle. This guy, for three hours, mesmerized the audience. I went up to him at the end, and I said, teach me how to do what you do. He said, look, kid, chance you making it is zero. One in a thousand of us make it as a speaker. You ain't going to make it. I said, let me determine that. Just teach me what to do. He said, you stay out of real estate. I own this five boroughs. I'll teach you how to do it. So that was the third miracle. The fourth one, I'm doing talks, and everyone asked, do you have that story in a book? Well, I've always loved to write since I was 16. So I put together a book, Stand Up, Speak on When, and to little audiences, six, 10, or 20 people, I sold this little book, Stand Up, Speak on When. I said, I'll sign to you and everybody, your wife, kids, dog, if you want. They, have. <laughs> and they thought it was cute. And I said, it isn't a national bestseller. It's not a New York Times bestseller, but it is my bestseller. <laughs> well, I sold 20,000 copies at $10 each in one year. I did $200,000. I'm back. I, I got a Chrysler Cordova with Corinthian <laughs> leather. I thought I'd have died and arrived. But I'm 26, and I'm back, and I've never stopped since. And not that I haven't had ups and downs and vicissitudes of pulsation. It just that luckily was my breakthrough. And, that, and a lot of people now are hanging on by their fingernails watching the show, and they're thinking we're making fun. We are not. We're just saying, look, if you're down, you got to visualize going up and ask yourself the questions on your destiny. Because once you're clear about your destiny, the path, it's much better. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Crystal? Thank yeah, you. so I think one of my most pivotal moments was when I was very young. I was um, one of those kids who found high school to be really easy and boring, super boring. <laughs> so <laughs> I accelerated my curriculum and I graduated myself at age 16 and married my boyfriend who was five years older. And uh, Turned out it wasn't a great life plan. Um, two and a half years later, I'm in a brand new city with no family, no friends, baby on my hip, divorced, and honestly no idea how I was going to support myself. And so I, the first thing I could think of was to apply for food stamps. So I went, um, I remember getting the food stamps and standing in the grocery store line that day, getting ready to turn my food stamps over for in exchange for you know food and diapers. And all of a sudden... This, it, it's a moment I'll never forget, honestly, Eric, because um, it was just a moment of truth. A question dropped into my mind. First question was like, how did I get here? Immediately followed by this life-changing question. And as this question came to my mind, it was like a, a spotlight was shining on my head. And it was, the question was, are you doing the best you can or are you taking the easy way out? And the second that question popped into my mind, I knew the answer. I knew I, I wasn't doing the best I could. I, I didn't even know what that was, to be honest with you, but I knew that wasn't it. I knew that wasn't me. I knew that wasn't my best in that moment. That question forced that truth out in me. And so I had this instant pivot so fast that as by the time I was handing the the uh, food stamps, the cashier, I was like saying with so much fierceness inside of myself, like so much conviction, this will not be my future. So I went back to my little apartment where I was getting eviction notices every month. And I just, I knew I didn't have answers, but I suddenly realized I had questions. So I started asking like, how can I make money tomorrow? Who would hire me? You know? Um, and suddenly I th thought of, as I'm asking the question, boom, the answer comes. I'd heard on the radio you know, temporary service agency. It was Kelly girls, right? We'll call, we'll hire you tomorrow, get work tomorrow, get paid tomorrow. So I thought of that. I called them up, filled out the paperwork. They start sending me jobs. You can say yes or no. Some jobs will last four days, some, you know, up to four weeks. But I started like filling in at attorney's offices and working, you know, at conventions, doing sales and setting up booths and malls, all these random things. But I started learning so much about myself. And one of the things I learned was that I just loved working with small business owners, you know, like, wow, they just like started a business. They just decided they wanted to have a business and they started it. That is so cool because I was, I was young. I didn't, you know, I hadn't really thought of that. I hadn't been exposed to it before. So um, I decided at that point to uh, get my real estate license. I put myself through real estate school. And in the meantime, someone had approached me and said, you should do some modeling. So by this time, I'm like, not afraid to ask. I walk into the biggest talent agency. I'm like, will you sign me? They're like, do you know how to do like read these lines? So I've like stumbled through some lines and then I, I stumbled down the runway trying to act like I knew what I was doing. And fortunately they signed me. And um, so literally a little bit more than a year and a half from that time, that moment that I was turning over my food stamps and I had that epiphany. I'm now 
a licensed realtor working for the largest home builder in our valley. I became the number one realtor and I did some television commercials for the talent agency and they went national. So now I'm getting residuals like royalty income. And once you book enough royalty income, they make you join Screen screen Actors (laughs) Guild. So now I'm getting like the best insurance benefits of all time, like literally the best insurance benefits you could get in the country for myself and my little boy. And I would think back on that moment often and think like, what if I had just cascaded easily into my victimization? You know, I had every, every excuse. I'm young. I can't do this on my own. But I'm so thankful that that question came to my mind and it challenged me. Like, are you doing the best you can or are you taking the easy way out? And I think, you know, sometimes we need to be able to ask ourselves those really tough questions because sometimes those will change us more than anything. And then be honest enough with ourselves to answer to answer honestly. I knew I wasn't doing the best I could. Yeah, yeah, I, it's, it, it's, it's, so, it's so incredible, the power, right? Of just getting, getting the questions right, asking the, the right questions at the right time. Um, I, had, uh, uh, I had come across um, uh, Stephen Pressfield's whole, you know, amateur versus pro um, thinking. And, um, and I, remember, I remember one day I, you know, I asked myself, uh, and I was, I was 41 years old. I remember when I did it, um, and I said, you know, am I a pro or an amateur in life? And I, and I, and I remember I, I decided to, you know, show up as a professional. And, and then the next thought I had was related to feeling in action. And I thought to myself, amateurs go around in life thinking that feeling generates action. So then they fall victim to Oh, did you write the book? No, why not? Well, I didn't feel like it. Oh, okay. Whereas pros I got in my mind know that the equation is flipped and that action generates feeling. And that was a pivotal moment for me because I started to take action, whether I felt like it or not in life, Um, knowing that the feelings that I was hoping to be on the forefront would suddenly emerge often just down the line by just getting the wheels you know, in motion. So that, that was uh, just for me sharing as well. That was like a, you know, powerful kind of, you know, question for me and, and probably, you know, just uh, one other share would be probably the most powerful question I have in my life is an ongoing one. So I get to the end of every day and I just ask myself, did I do my best today? And, um, and of course I start the day with an intention to do so on the health front, on the wealth front, on the relationship front. And, um, and then I just keep track of the score. And I get a W for a win on my wall calendar and I get an L for a learn if I didn't. Um, and uh, my simple game is, you know, no more than six L's in a month so that I have an 80%, you know, W win rate and never two L's in a row. And, um, and so, yeah, questions and asking the right questions at the right time, both at a pivotal moment and then on an ongoing basis, I'm sold. I'm there with you. <laughs> I just love that, Eric. Did I do my best today? And I love that you track it um, because it it does allow you to see your life unfolding and uh, allows you to galvanize your intention more about doing your best every day, you know, because that's the creative process, like choosing in your mind how your day is going to go. That's part of this. And, and talk about percentage of wins. What is, show me your matrix on percentage of wins, percentage of losses. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so what I what I shoot for is eighty percent. So um, eighty. So, so on average, no more than six L's. You know, six six days in a month have an L in the calendar box, right? So, because um, because that that comes out to about an eighty percent success rate, and you know, eighty percent is good enough. And I think. Uh, a lot of people, um, you, know, you know, again, back to the Pareto principle, what's 20% of the effort? I mean, it's just another angle on it, right? 20% of the effort for 80% of the result, meaning that we're willing to sacrifice 20%. You know, it's, it's okay because it's that okay. can be good enough or it gives us the opportunity to move on to that next thing, however you want to use the time, right? Um, now, um we talked about, or you, 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 you made a comment about small business owners, Crystal, um, when you were sharing your, 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 your story. And um, I just had a question for you both. What's, 
what's one question that um, entrepreneurs, the average entrepreneur or you know, leader um, should be asking themselves, but isn't? What's the number one question they should be asking you themselves, know- but they're not? I think the most important question we can ask ourselves as entrepreneurs is, you know, because because we're going to have issues, things come up, we don't have all the answers, we got to figure things out. But if we go to that space, and we almost have to go inside into that quiet space, like, so asking yourself, what's the perfect scenario? Like, if, if this were solved perfectly, what would what would this look like? So instead of getting, you know, sometimes we get embroiled at the level of the problem. So we're just kind of scrambling around in the problem. I think it's really important to kind of go above the problem and go to your ideal scenario. And, and, and that goes with relationships, personal relationships or anything like in the nth degree of, of a perfect situation, what, what would this whole thing look like at almost at the, at a higher level? So what that tends to do is not not allow you to get super embroiled at the level of the problem so much that you're missing a bigger opportunity for a solution that may transcend any other little patchwork solutions you might be thinking have to happen. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense. Love it. And Mark, what's, what's from your point of view? Thank you. For... The people you're talking to, the last question we ask in the book, because we ask the biggest questions, and Peter Demanda says, what are you personally going to do in this decade to positively affect one billion people? Well, most people go, well, all I want to do is get along. I want to just have my 10 employees, 100, mm-hmm. 1,000 employees do well. No. What are you going to do to positively affect? And what, what I'm going to do, just so we're clear, is I'm going to get a billion people more to read books that didn't read before or listen to audios on their iPhone. Wow. And we're going to transform consciousness because, look, if Plato's right, and I think he is, who controls the narrative controls the world and the future um, essence of it. And I've morphed him a little bit, but the, I can give it linearly if you need it. But the point is, I'm here and I am a persuasive, effective communicator based on results of a half billion readers that are or a billion readers, half billion sold. Is that I want to transform the world from good to phenomenally good to get everybody up into two percent? I think, and we didn't say this at the beginning of the show, is that everybody belongs in a two percent, and everybody is here with a destiny in that zone. But what they don't do, and now I'm on my bully pulpit. They don't ask these questions. They don't read our book. If they read the book and go over it with somebody else and ask every question, they'll go, holy cow, I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling despondent. Uh, my relationships aren't right. I've never really thought through what a business. My mother said, I got to be an engineer, or a doctor, or a lawyer, or you're, you're a nobody. No, no, that isn't it. You are here to do something phenomenal and serve greatly with love. Beautiful. So for the person who wants to build that bridge between their dreams and their destiny um, and get a copy of ask where, where, where do they grab a copy or uh, are there any, you know, is there a website associated with the book where they can learn more? Where should we uh, direct people's attention? Yes. So um, it's everywhere, you know, Amazon, of course, it's a Kindle audio book there. It's a beautiful hardcover book. Most people are loving that. Um, and then, and, or Barnes and Noble and some of the independent store bookstores have it as well, but it seems like Amazon's just the easiest for everybody to go to. And then please join us. We are, we want to continue to help guide people to become master askers. So we're having this completely free webinar. Um, if you go to ask the book club, after you buy the book, read the book. So you come prepared because it's going to be a discussion and we're going to take this further. But get the book and then go to askthebookclub.com and join us. We're going to be sending out the invitation very soon. And uh, we're super excited about it because we we believe we can fundamentally change the way people operate by learning um, to take this, this asking journey is what we call it. Take the asking journey with us and just see how your life unfolds in a much more powerful, exciting, positive way. Crystal, Mark, I'm... So grateful for getting the chance to speak to you both. Uh, I'm a fan. Um, love the book. Thank you. And um, thank you for your time. And thanks for all the service uh, that you have been giving your entire lives to others. Um, you're working on the one thing that unites us all, regardless of geography, 
religion, ethnicity, our common practice, our common thing is to help elevate each other and close that gap, help us, you know, become the best version of ourselves. So, so thanks for, for all you do in that area. And uh, if you've watched and listened uh, this far, please um, follow up uh, with uh, Crystal's pointers there and take advantage of all the good stuff that Crystal and Mark are putting out. Thanks again. It's been Thanks, our delight. Eric, our Thank pleasure. you for having us, Eric. Hope you enjoyed that discussion, and I know you're going to absolutely love the next one as well. It's with John Lee Dumas talking about his newest book and all the incredible things that you can be learning to increase your financial awareness and wealth. And I know you'll love that. Just click on the link right here, and I'll see you there.